Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, let me start off by saying, uh, any of you camera shy? This is being recorded in the back. So if you turn around, your faces will be all over the internet by morning. Okay? All right, just wanted to let you know. My name is Alan Hall, and uh, for some oddball reason, they wanted me to come in and talk to you all about astrophotography. Now, the reason I say that's oddball is I've been doing this for all of about four months. Okay? So that gives me an interesting perspective in that I kind of did a crash course over the past four months. I was very fortunate the way this happened in that I managed to come into a little bit of money that I could throw into this particular hobby all at once. And so that caused me to do a whole lot of research in a big hurry. Uh, then once I got my equipment, there was a huge learning curve. So let me tell you a little bit about me uh, as far as astronomy goes. Uh, first off, uh, I've been a photographer since uh, mid-80s. Uh, I'm actually a professional commercial photographer. I uh, have been for several years. Um, so that's kind of where the photography aspect came into this. The astro part of this started about 15 years ago. Um, I started making enough money that I decided I wanted to buy a telescope because I've always been fascinated by, well, when we all, by what's up there. So <clears throat> bought a telescope and it was a little uh, EQ mount uh, reflector and uh, hated its guts. And the only reason, the only reason I didn't run over it with my car repeatedly is I didn't want to damage my car. So it became a uh, living room uh, showpiece for about 15 years. Um, then I decided I was going to do it the right way. Went out and bought a nice reflector, I mean refractor, sorry, uh, with everything I needed to hook my camera up and got started. Now this uh, isn't really going to be a whole lot about technical stuff. That's why I made this. 19 pages of everything you need to know to ask intelligent questions. Because as we all know, there is no, nobody knows the answers to everything. But this ought to have enough of a broad coverage that when you get done with this, you can ask some intelligent questions and actually understand the answers. That was one of my hardest things when I got started in this, was understanding what people were telling me. Well, why aren't my stars round? Well, that's probably coma, but it could be a field flatter. Why, who? Uh, I don't think my telescope's in a coma, and uh, there's nothing flat about the objective on the end, so I don't know what you're talking about. Well, this will hopefully help you understand those answers so that you'll know what they are. What I'm going to talk about uh, is a little in addition to this, and that is what you can do with astrophotography and where I'm going with it and why. Um, hopefully give you some ideas of, of where you may want to go. Um, one of the, the First things that I had a problem with is people tell me I couldn't do things. And I don't like it when people tell me I can't do things. That, that annoys me. And what annoys me more is when they tell me, oh, you can't do that. And you sit there and think about it and you go, why? There's no logic behind this. So the one thing I want you to take away from this more than anything else is use your common sense. Grab a book. If something doesn't sound right, Try it. We're, we're in a digital age. It's not going to cost you any more to trip that shutter in here. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you're doing CCD, webcam, DSLR. It doesn't cost anything. Try it. See what happens. Borrow parts. Piece them together. Use duct tape. Who cares? Just try it. And the thing that really got me on this was I was told that you can't shoot H-alpha with an unmodified DSLR. So I started thinking, why? Last time I checked, H-alpha was in the visible spectrum. So in theory, Aunt Matilda could wear this, that particular color red sweater to a family picnic and I take her picture, what's her sweater going to do, disappear? This makes no sense to me. So went out, bought a hydrogen alpha filter, screwed it on the end, took a picture, and guess what? Well, you know, I don't really want to call anybody a liar, but here's the picture. So then the next thing they said was, oh, well, yeah, you can do that, but you're going to have to have, you know, 25, 30 minute exposures minimum. And I was like, <coughs> really? Well, let's see. That is a stack of 480 second exposures at ISO 800. This is a 480 second exposure at ISO 800. Now, this isn't quite as pretty as that. Look at how it doesn't work. Now, the problem is, 
as I later learned, that way back when, digital cameras used to be a whole lot less sensitive to red than they are now. Now, they still put filters over them to knock out the real high end of the red spectrum. But what nobody took into consideration is, uh, these are all shot with the Nikon D7000. And it's about a billion times more sensitive than the old D100s and the Canon, what were the 10Ds, the really old ones, uh, before they came out with the 20DA. Uh, so what they did was they saw what happened years and years and years ago. Nobody bothered to check it since then, and they've just been regurgitating that over and over and over. So now what I'm working on is actually doing narrowband with an unmodified DSLR, which if you go online, I'll take it. Can't do that. Well, we're going to try it and see. So far, the results have been very promising. Um, I was talking about there's three different kinds of astrophotography, basically. There is uh, webcam, DSLR, and CCD. They all have advantages and disadvantages, and they're all aimed at something a little more, a little different than, than each other. Um, it's not that anyone's any better than the other, they're just better for different applications. Um, webcam is, is the first one because it's the easiest. Uh, you can use a regular webcam, or you can get uh, Orion, uh, Celestron, a bunch of them sell little planetary web cameras. A little USB camera that plugs right in where the eyepiece is. And what these are great for are planets. Uh, moon is an excellent example, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, any of those. What they do is they take up to thousands of images, and they will take the absolute best little piece of each image and stitch it together with all these other little pieces that he got from other frames. So in frame one, this crater may be good. And in frame 30, that crater may be good. It'll take those two and put them in one frame. Um, trying to do DSOs, which I assume most of you all know what that is, deep space optics, uh, this kind of stuff. With a webcam, don't do that. But that's a waste of time and effort. And it ain't going to do anything but make you mad. Um, next is uh, probably CCD. CCDs, um, I think of that as the, the end-all, be-all. Um, you can't use a CCD for anything other than astrophotography. You can't take it off and bring it in here and start taking pictures of people. Wouldn't think you could. Actually, that might be something else to try. But you're not supposed to do that. Um, it's not set up for that. You can't really put lenses on it and that kind of stuff other than a telescope. Um, that is really good for doing stuff like, if you look over here on the wall, you see this Rosette Nebula? That guy and this guy are the same thing. The only difference is this is an unmodified DSLR, which means this is closer to what you'd actually see if you could see it, if that makes any sense. You can't see it because your eye can't hold its shutter open long enough to collect enough light to actually see it. But if it could, that's more what it would like. That's called narrowing. <coughs> that is shot with three different filters on the front and not red, blue, green, like a lot of people assume because you can use red, blue, green on the CCD to come up with this, basically. But that's shot with three narrow band filters, which only allow a little sliver of light in at a time. And CCDs are great at that because they're very, very sensitive to those wavelengths. Now, DSLR, on the other hand, not so sensitive to those wavelengths. It can still be done, as the picture right over here shows you. Um, but it's a little more difficult. Um, where DSLR accepts is the fact that I can yank my DSLR off and go shoot a course photo shoot, bring it back, throw it right back on the telescope and go to town. Which is exactly what I'm going to do tonight when I'm out of here. Because it's a clear sky and there's hardly any wind. So, um, so those are the three basic types. CCD basic prime focus telescope or is there an IVs? No, CCD and DSLR are usually both prime focus. DSLR has the advantage of you can actually use an eyepiece if you want to. Uh, from what I have seen, it tends to distort the image quite a bit, um, but you can do it. And of course, there's also a focal, which I don't talk about very much. It's just take a camera up to the eyepiece, take a picture off. Yeah. So what about the new non-DSLR cameras that are coming out now that don't use a mirror? Okay. Um, I have seen some people try those, and the only success I've seen is a focal. And it hadn't been that great. Um, strictly because a focus is not that great to begin with. The problem that you're going to have right now with those is there's no real support for them. So finding uh, adapters, because some of them use slightly different lens mounts, uh, or like the Fuji, where the lens isn't removable at all. Um, and in addition to that, you don't have any software to drive it to do your own exposures. 
Now, barring those, they ought to do quite well. Because yeah, uh, I've seen I've seen the Nikon, one of those, mm -hmm. and it takes all the same lenses and all the same software and everything. It just doesn't have a mirror. So. Okay, I have not seen that one. Um, the uh, Fujis and the Sony Nex fives, I believe, and those are all a little different. Um, I believe they using the uh, smaller factor lenses, yeah. um, so that they're more pocketable. So that's going to be a real problem mounting it on the scope. But those problems aside, um, they should be fantastic cameras for that kind of stuff, depending on what they look like uh, on long exposures. Um, which is one of the problems you may run into with DSLRs. Uh, while we're on that subject, is long exposures with DSLRs. The sensor was never really meant to do that, so some cameras are going to exhibit some weird artifacts. One of the things you can run into is called amp noise. When the sensor heats up unevenly, you'll see different colored glows uh, on your image. You wonder where it came from. It looks almost like, uh, look on here, it's almost like that, except that's light pollution. Although it's kind of pretty light version, but anyway. Um, the modern cameras don't have a lot of amp noise. My D7000 has none that I've ever seen. And I've run 25 minute exposures on it. Never had a problem. Um, so you need to watch out for things like that. And that's something we're going to have to look at with the mirrorless cameras and see how their sensors hold up. Uh, because they're, they're slightly different sensors than what we're using in DSLRs. Um, one of the things I see recommended all the time is for somebody to go get an old DSLR, uh, have it modded, and use it. I would be very leery of that. Uh, the reasons for that are the older sensors are going to have a lot more amp noise. They're also going to generate a whole lot more noise noise, uh, which is one of the reasons I want to bring these pictures up here. Is these are 20 by 24 enlargements, and if you look at it, there's no grain, there's no noise, it's nice and smooth. The reason for that is it's an 18 megapixel sensor off of D7000. And that's a full crop. The only thing that's been cut off of this is the sides right here, which make the, the images really large. Now, that's what I went after with my astrophotography. Now, everybody's going to have something different that they want to come up with. Um, you know, not everybody wants to blow these up this big or bigger and, and put them on their living room wall. Some people want to take pictures, show them to their friends, put them on Facebook, and that's fine. Uh, there's no right or wrong to any of this. But the direction I went was I wanted big pictures as sharp, clear, and smooth as I could get them. And so that's the, the direction I went. And that influenced uh, everything I bought, every direction I went. So if you're just getting into astrophotography, <coughs> the first thing you need to come up with is what do you want out of it? Where, where do you want this to go? Uh, are we talking about you want a picture of gay big on Facebook? Show people? Then you can do that cheap. You can do that with an as mount. You can do it with a little webcam. You know, off you go. If you want to do this kind of stuff, or better, which is where I'm going, but I'm just starting here, then that influences the type of scope you're going to get, and so on and so forth. Uh, the mount's going to need to be better so that it's more accurate, so that your stars are rounder, you're going to need field flatteners, you're going to need certain filters, and, and it just goes on and on and on. So once you figure out what you want to do, you can then zero in on exactly what you need to do. Now this will cover a lot of the, the very basics, like what kind of mount, why. It shows you what field rotation is on all AS mounts versus EQ mounts, um, so that you know why most astrophotographers use EQ mounts instead of all AS. One thing that I learned by writing this that just blew my mind was Celestron has two C8 telescopes. One's on an EQ mount, one's on an all AS mount. All AS mount's more expensive than the EQ. Whatever they were drinking when they did that, I want some. Because that was some really good stuff. All as mounts are almost always cheaper. That's your dogs it's over here. All as mounts. Uh, and I've had people tell me, oh, well, you know, you can get the all as and, and stick a wedge on it. Okay, well, that moves the scope off axis more, so it's not near as good as, as an EQ mount. But then you add that to the all as, which is more expensive to begin with. That doesn't make any sense to me. So that's part of the whole do your research and find out what you need. <coughs> okay. um, back to what I originally started with, always try new things. I, I can't tell you how many times I've done things that people tell you you, you just can't do. One of my favorites was um, without a CCD or a modified uh, DSLR, you can't do the electron. Um, 
Anybody here seen the elephant trunk? You know which nebula I'm talking about? Oh, well, I've seen pictures of it. Okay. Um, elephant trunk is a very faint, uh, it's much like the spider in the fly, which I believe is IC417. Um, very, very faint, very, very hard to see. Well, you're not going to see it, period, but very hard to see when you're doing astrophotography. If you've got a CCD, you can usually see it in H alpha. If you give it 20 plus minutes exposure, you start to see some pretty good nebulosity. Short of that, no. DSLR, I posted a picture up on a thread on a forum. A guy telling you, oh, you've got to have a modified camera or a CCD to do it. He basically called me a liar, so I didn't actually take that picture. Why would I do that? Would you like the raw file? Anyway, um, so today's technology with cameras advancing the way they are, and that's all cameras, the CCDs, the webcams, and the DSLRs. But the way they're advancing, all the stuff they said you couldn't do two or three years ago, you can do now. So try it. Don't let anybody tell you, no, no, you can't do it. Yeah, you can. Try it. It may take some, some jumping through some hoops, little tweaks here and there. Uh, one of the things I played with was this H alpha image right here is actually shot with a batter. Uh, two inch, 32 nanometer H alpha filter. It's the only one of its kind that I've ever found. Uh, most of them are like seven nanometers, nine nanometers, very thin slices, all the way down to three nanometers or four nanometers. So it's a very, very small spectrum, or part of the visible spectrum. This is 32, so it's a little wider, so I got a little bit more red. The reason I did that is a lot of you probably seen pictures of uh, the rosette, not the, the ones like the Hubble takes. But pictures where they're all, it's all bright red, looks like real bright candy red. It's the one I took two days ago. <laughs> okay. No offense, everybody has their own way of doing things, and you know, we all drive different cars too, we all like different stuff. I hate that. That just, the all red glowing candy apple just drives me up the wall. There's no way that thing is all one red color. It just, <laughs> no. So that's why you see this is pink, red, and it's actually got some maroon out on the edge and a little bit of blue on the inside. That's, but that's, once again, that's personal preference. I could turn that around in Photoshop and turn that bright red if I wanted to. I could make it pretty with yellow stripes. <laughs> but I don't. But we're back to basically what I do with mine, and you'll see this in all of them, like this one, this one, and even to an extent this one. They are all the natural colors being let through. I didn't change any colors in any of them. But you can't, and you can shoot uh, H-alpha, uh, S2, and O3, and come up with a rosette that looks like that one. So it's whatever you want to do, and that's part of the beauty behind this, is there's so many things to try. And now that's called Hubble palette, but you can actually take those three narrow bands and rearrange them. Uh, I forget the actual color scheme, but I think, I think H-alpha is green, O3 is red, and S2 is blue. I may be wrong, but anyway. The sulfur is red. Okay. Um, but you can change those around and completely change the palette. Uh, it's not home palette anymore, but who cares? This is what you wanted to do. Try it, play with it. I've seen some amazing astrophotography that doesn't, you know, it's not natural color, it's not Hubble palette. I don't know what it is, but it's cool. <laughs> um, so try it, play with it, see what you think. Now, one other thing about astrophotography that a lot of people don't think of. Is most of your targets, like this one and this one, you <coughs> issue one set of images. This is, I think, 40 images, 480 seconds a pop. Then I stack them together with darks. And it comes up with this. But what happens when you get something like M42? How many people have seen M42 in a telescope? I actually looked at it. Most of them? Okay. Have you noticed that it's just this blob? It's this, in a regular telescope, it's just nondescript block. You don't see any of this color and fancy hoo-ha. Okay, now how many of you seen the Hubble telescope picture of it? Anybody? Okay. Then you were going to know that all this detail right here is actually there. Now, what's interesting is, if you've ever, anybody ever taken a picture of M42? Is that any astrophotography? No? Yeah, yeah. Okay. When you take a picture of M42, what you'll see, I don't have one here. Um, what you'll see is one of two things. Either this little center, center area here looks okay, kind of smooth, but no big deal. But none of this out here is here. No, no, it's, it's not that. Or you'll see the other one. You'll see a lot of stuff out here, 
but the center is completely white. I mean, it's just bright, glow in the dark, you can't see anything. The reason for that is M42 is one of a handful of targets. The other is going to be, and there's a picture of that right there, M31, which I actually have a picture in here of M31 somewhere. Uh, M31 is another one of those. It actually takes a special type of, of photography to do this. It's called HDR. Now, most astrophotographers I know of don't use the phrase HDR. They don't like the phrase. It's called high dynamic range. That's a holdover from my photography days because we do HDR all the time. Uh, so when we, you know, when I looked at that and somebody told me how to do it, and I was like, well, that's HDR, and they're like, 50 what? Okay, fine. But it's all the same thing. And what happens is you take a set of images, just like you would for this, at one exposure. So you move the exposure, and you do it again. You move the exposure, you do it again. You move the exposure, you do it again. There's like seven different exposures in here. And then I blend all of those together. That's the only way you will ever see this center section, that detail, and the outer section still visible. You can see when, when this is over, you come up and look. But there's a, a fine dust lane all the way out here. Little wisps going way off in the Never Never Land. And those are exposed, but the center is also highly detailed. So that's another thing that's really neat about astrophotography is that there are targets out there that you can play with and do things that most people haven't ever thought of like HDR to M42. I've only seen probably three or four people ever do that kind of stuff, where they actually blend them together to that extent. Most people will take like two of them, say one, two together, done. Because then you get some, you know, the center's not quite bright white, but it's smooth, there's no detail. And that's why I did like six or seven different layers, so that I get all the detail. If you take a look at that and go look at the Hubble image, you'll see that all of that detail really is there. Hubble looks a little better. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> but it's actually that, and, and it's amazing that the technology we have today with HDR software and the, the great cameras that we have and the great scopes we have can actually do stuff that doesn't rival the, the Hubble but can actually show you the same things that the Hubble can, which I think is just amazing. Just drop dead amazing. When you talk about multiple exposures, like the seven, you talk about yeah, you know, subsequent nights, the same built in the same place, or? Actually, I did that one all in one night. What I did was, uh, I did like 10 5 second exposures, 10 10 second, 10 20 second, 10 40 second, 10 90 second, 10 180 second. 180 seconds, yeah. And then I took each of those and stacked it, and then I blended all of those together in a HDR program. <coughs> that's what gave me the final image. So why wouldn't all the 10 second exposures look the same? Well, all the 10 seconds do. The reason you take multiple exposures, and all that's explained in here, is that by taking multiple exposures, you're getting rid of the noise in the background. Because if you take one, um, your signal to noise ratio is very low because the, the software doesn't really know whether this model black, especially like on this picture, like these little wisps you see going out, is that noise or is that grain or amp noise? What is it? So as you take multiple exposures, any kind of aberration like amp noise or noise generated in the camera, just signal noise, will vary. Whereas the signal, which is the little wisp of dust, aren't going to vary, at least not in our lifetimes. So if you take a whole bunch of exposures, then the software can say, well, this pixel never ever changes. So it leaves it the same. But this pixel over here, every time he takes a shot, this changes to something else. So it sees that and it gets rid of that. And that's why you stack multiple of the same exposure. Like in this one, multiple 480 seconds. In this one, you got 10 fives, 10 tens, and so on and so forth, and then you can find them. Well, that's basically the direction I go and, and, and what I feel about astrophotography. Do we have any specific questions? Does the software you use allow you to in sound, we do something called companding. Does it allow you to transform certain parts of things? I guess it must. Have you yeah, done that? There's an awful lot of software involved in most astrophotography. Um, even after the, the initial capture, I don't do anything on site other than just capture. Take it home. Um, the first thing I do is run it through a program called Deep Sky Stacker. Mm -hmm. And it'll tell you about that it's in the manual. Deep Sky Stacker is the program that sandwiches all of the same exposures together. So all my <coughs> 30 or 40, 480 second exposures sandwiches it together and figures out what signal, what's noise, 
the more you take, um, the more signal to noise ratio, or the better the signal to noise ratio is, um, it's to a point, uh, it's a diminishing returns. Uh, using the inverse square law, you can figure out that somewhere between 30 and 40, unless you just to want to kill yourself, is about where you want to be. Um, now, once you stack it in Deep Sky Stacker, uh, the next thing I do is import it into Lightroom, do my cropping basic adjustments in Lightroom. From there, it goes into Photoshop. And from Photoshop, I do all my serious stretching of the image to bring out the, the fine details. And from there, it goes back into Lightroom for finishing touches, and then I'm done. Unless I'm bringing out something this big, and then it goes into another program whose name I can't remember because I don't use it that often, uh, which does nothing but make it really big. Does a real good job of it, too. That's an old not from camera. Mm -hmm. It will uh, give out the raw image, which is a 12 bit conversion. Mm -hmm. And if you just uh, expose the uh, highlights, mm -hmm. you, in uh, Photoshop, you can extract. Because you've got an additional 16 times the exposure to the in there with the 12 bit conversion. It doesn't really work that way. Um, these are uh, D7000s. So these are actually, I have a dynamic range you wouldn't believe. But one like M42 is the equivalent of standing in front of somebody's car when they turn the high beams on in the middle of the night. And then you try to read a newspaper in front of them. It's not happening. The, the difference between this central region and these outer edges is so dramatic. Yes, but with the 16 to 1, yeah, and considering that your final image might be on an 8-bit range, uh, with a 12-bit raw image, you've got a margin of 16 times. Right. It's not going to work that way. Trust me. <laughs> I shoot like I'm wrong. You don't have that much latitude in, in the image. Uh, even with a 12 bit, it, you're not, because what you're leaving out is your 12 bits is from the lightest to the darkest. Mm -hmm. So if you're already <coughs> shooting you know, above zero, then now you've only got 15, and so on and so forth. It's graduated in scale. Um, if this is your latitude, you know, along this line, the camera's going to try and shoot for 18% gray, which is dead center. Okay? So if you shoot something dead center, and something else is, if you're 12, so if you're seven away, you're only seven away from where the camera shoot. Well, that puts you one outside already. See where I'm going with that? Yeah, but you can actually uh, see a histogram of your uh, pixel um, uh, on the So you can, you can aim at just marginally saturated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you look at charts of that going into the histogram here, there's a histogram of that. It was. Not passing drama again, I think. There's a histogram right there. Yeah. <clears throat> the problem is going to be you're finding a couple of things here. And this goes into great detail over it. The histogram, if y'all open it up, You'll notice that your histogram in here is about 15% uh, of the way over from the left-hand side. So you've got a clear margin down that left-hand side, which is what you want. Because if you hit that left-hand margin, what you're doing is killing your blacks. Uh, you're taking, if you look at this picture, you'll see I've got the, the background is almost black, and then just a little bit lighter than black, you've got some of these dust lights. And I mean, they're just a little tiny bit higher than that black. Um, so you get further away, you can't see them at all. And what happens is, if that histogram gets that left side all the way, you start eating away at these dust lines, and they start disappearing. Okay. The same happens over on the left-hand side. If this were all the way slammed into the left, what would happen is your stars would lose some definition. You'd start clipping highlights instead of clipping shadows. Well, what we're talking about is the range in between the two. Now, if you notice this, you see this is a very small spike? That's the problem you're running into. Histogram is a fantastic little tool, and if you take it out and shoot a picture in the daylight, what you're going to see is a much bigger spike 
and you're generally going to see it much closer to the center. You've got a whole lot of data to work with. The problem with astrophotography is, I wish I remembered what this was actually a histogram of, but the problem with it, I'll bet it's the rosette, is that if you notice here, you've got black blacks and you've got white whites, and then you've got all these blues and paints and reds and maroons, and it fades out. You can see a little bit of dust out on the outer edge and all that stuff. All of that detail is in this teeny tiny little spike here. Okay? So what you do is you go in and grab this and stretch it. That's not exactly what you do, but it's close. Basically, you stretch all of this out so that you get a much wider amount of data. Okay? When you get into something like M42 or M31, you can't do that. Well, you can to a point. But the problem gets to be that M42, when this is blown completely out, this is still almost a razor thin line. So the amount of latitude you have in your sensor is irrelevant because all of that data is trying to be packed in this itty bitty little line, and it's not ever going to fit. So when you go to stretch it out to your 12 bits, or actually 16 bits is what you're going to want to use in, in Photoshop or a program like that. You're going to stretch that out to, to 16 bits or as close as you can get without clipping something. And your highlights are going to completely blow out if you expose for this. Because it's just the latitude is just not there. There's no room in that histogram. And that's what you'll see. But that <coughs> only applies to a handful of targets. Other targets like this you can do. But you want to make sure, and you're absolutely right about going to your histogram, you want to make sure that when you're out shooting in the middle of the night, this is what you look at. Because if you look at the next page, that top image is the properly exposed rosette nebula. This picture right here. That's what it looks like coming out of, of the camera. All right? So that's sitting on my laptop screen, and over the top of my laptop screen is a, a piece of red ruby lift. So it's, it's red. So do you think I can see diddly? You know, I'm sitting there squinting and going sideways and tilting the screen going, yeah, okay, yeah, it's there. Okay, keep going. Um, so that's barely all that you can see. If you brighten it up to this down here, you, you've just blown it out. So that's why you have to look at this to make sure you're on target and that your background is, is dark. And the rest of the time you watch this history. You want that histogram off of that left-hand side. Uh, and you don't want it too far over because it's going to slam into the right-hand side. But what I found is generally 10% to 25% off of that left-hand side, you're good. Now, the other thing I, I want to make sure I tell you, and it, it says right here, so I'm going to read this and see. Uh -huh. These guidelines are to give you something to start with. Only your experience in trial and error will get you where you need to be to create great images. Because every image is different. It's different in capturing. It's different in, in processing. If you think, oh, well, this picture, I took 480 seconds at ISO 800, and I took 30 of them. Well, this picture, I did the exact same thing. So all I have to do is do exactly what I did to this one, to this one in Photoshop, and I'm done. No, it's not going. <laughs> Sorry. Doesn't happen. It's all a little different. So it's all experience. It's all trial and error. Some programs respond better to curve, or some pictures respond better to curve, some respond better to uh, levels, and some respond better to a combination of the two in no particular order. So it's lots of fun. Any more questions? How do you get to start the smaller pinpoints? I guess that's part of the processing? Actually, um, yes and no. There's two pieces to that. The processing side of it is you want the exposure right to begin with because if you have to stretch the highlights too much, your stars will go from this big, big to this big, and you don't want that. The other side of that is you want to make sure that your mount is extremely stable and that your scope has appropriate, um, like I shoot a refractor, refractor needs a field flattener. If you don't use a field flattener, these stars, and you can actually you look real close, you can see that these stars aren't perfectly round up here in the corners. Right. Because this was actually shot before I got the spacer for my field flatter to make it just exactly flat. Oh, okay. 
So for reflectors, you're going to need coma correctors. For refractors, you're going to need field flatteners. All that's in the handout, by the way. And uh, then, of course, you need a, a very stable mount. And uh, the other part of that is the smaller the telescope, the better it's going to track. That's another reason I like refractors for this particular type of work over reflectors. Because reflectors are usually big wind buckets. And if somebody sneezes in the next county, it moves. Yeah, my refractor, you know, weighs a ton and it's only like a big, so it don't matter. Any more questions? If you want to go the cheap route, what would you start with? Um, once again, it would depend on what my final output was going to be. What do I want to do? Um, if you want to get into some not very small stuff, but stuff like this, um, you can go, Orion has a little package that has a little EDA scope, um, a little camera, and I think it's an EQ3 tripod uh, for a very reasonable amount. I don't remember what they wanted for it, but it, it's Orion. Mm -hmm. It was very cheap. And Celestron may have a package as well. I'm just a little more familiar with Orion because that's what I bought, so I spent many hours pouring over their catalogs. But they have a little package just for that kind of stuff. Um, and some of the targets you can do, like uh, M42 and uh, M31, like he's got up here on the wall, you can do those uh, on all gas mounts, so a little Dobson or something. You can do those. Anything else? Y'all sleep? Both? So are you, <laughs> are you shooting mostly colored in, not the, where you have um, monochrome? Yeah, yeah, basically that's divided into two pieces. It's one shot color or not. Uh, one shot color is means not. you've got a sensor that reads RGB all at one time. Right. And I'm, I'm using a D7000, so yeah, it's RGB one shot color. Um, the alternative to that is you, you're shooting basically black and white and you stick filters in front of it. Right. Which is where I'm going. I'm still going to use an RGB sensor, uh, but I'm only using it for luminance values, so I don't really care what color comes out as long as the luminance is right, which is the intensity. And I'm going to be sticking narrow bands in front of it, like this page out of here on the end. Oh, well, you can do that? Well, I guess you can. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, Unless okay. you go online, in which case I'll tell you anything. Oh, you can do anything you want. But yeah. Like you say, you can do whatever. Because I've got, I've got an Orion Pro Shot, uh, what it is, a six megapixel camera, the twelve hundred dollars uh, two years ago, and I got a well, a Neon 120. That's what I started with, that. and I didn't have much software. <coughs> And yeah, everything is burned out in the middle. See, yeah. another thing I'll tell you. I've got some software started. I still learn. I mean, I just got software a month ago. So I'm starting to reprocess some stuff. And I can, I, I want to ask you some questions afterwards. Yeah, it, it never ends. But another thing I'll tell you is you, to do planetary stuff like the moon, you want really good pictures of the moon, you got to get a webcam. Because the webcam takes a thousand pictures and, and you stack them all together, register. There's a problem with that. It's a webcam. We can maximum resolution is 1920 by something, like, you know, 900 yeah. or something. Just a teeny little Facebook friggin' image. I don't yeah. want that. Oh, you can get a picture. I got a good picture of the moon. But you got to do a thousandth of a second exposure, which is difficult with that camera. In fact, I had to put a barlow on there and put two pieces together. Mm -hmm. What you can do is take your together. DSLR. Or put a filter if, in there. Yeah, if you're doing your DSLR anyway for a long exposure, you just take a DSLR, a little remote, and just... <laughs> <laughs> just sit there for a while, just watching the episode of Stargate SG-1, just doing this. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, that'll be, yeah, it's like 120 images, okay. And then you stick those in the program, let it stack those, and guess what? Now you've got 49.91 pixels by 32.89. Yeah, now I can blow this up. I can picture the moon, it's like this. <laughs> Anything else? No? Okay. Well, if you have any questions or anything, uh, one thing I did not do, and I'm terribly sorry because this was all in the last minute, it's his fault, um, is I did not put my uh, website address on here because I've got more information on the website. And it's real easy to remember. It's Allen's, A L L A N S, dash stuff, S T U F F dot com. And there's an astronomy link up on the menu. <coughs> Click on there, and I've got my astrophotography work, and I've got uh, this document, in case you, know, you lose it or you know somebody wants it, there's a PDF of this, and uh, there'll be a video of this, and there's a, another video of, if you've ever wondered what all it takes to set up all the equipment to do a night of, 
uh, astro turner and you will it'll blow your mind and probably make you run away screaming. But there's a video up there that shows you putting it all together as it's getting dark and what all you have to do and balancing the scope and get all that good stuff. Okay. All right. Well, I hope y'all enjoyed it, and I'm glad to see you to sleep. Thank you.